talking about a man who went out to sow seed. He went out to sow seed, which we know parabolically um, represents the word of God. Now, when we talk about parables, parables use a principle called juxtaposition. When you juxtaposition a thing, you put two things side by side with a dividing line down the middle, and you make comparative inferences between the two things. In other words, if I say, for instance, as an example, John 15, where Jesus says that I'm the vine and ye are the branches. He says, my father is the husbandman. And he says, abide in me as I abide in you, as you can, and you can bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can bear nothing. So he uses the picture of a vine to show us spiritual connection and spiritual fruitfulness. So, so he shows us how the vine functions on one side, which in that time and in that context, the main um, 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 beverage of the day was water or wine. So everyone understood what vineyards were all about. So he takes us to the picture of the vineyard to show us the spiritual relationship between the believer through Jesus Christ to the Father. So, so we call this juxtaposition or parabolic teaching. In Matthew 13, we find Jesus speaking of, speaking of the kingdom on this wise. The same day, the Bible says, he went out of the house and sat by the seaside. And the great multitude were gathered together with him so that they went into a ship and sat the whole multitude and stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, in parabolic teachings, in wise teachings that juxtapose things, they put things side by side to teach us a message. So he, so he goes out and he's now on the ship, they're on the shore, and he begins to talk to them in a parable. Watch this, he says, behold a sower, behold a sower went to sow, and when he sowed some fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon the stony place where they had not much earth and forthwith they sprung up because they had no depthness of earth. And when the sun was upon them, they were scorched. Listen, the Bible says they were scorched. Hallelujah. They were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground. Hallelujah. Fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. He who had ears to hear, let him hear. Now watch this. And then the disciples came unto him um, and said, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Now, here's, here's where we want to go in the context of this discussion. He says, he answered and said unto them, because, because it is given to you, watch this, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. It is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He, he, Jesus says to them, I want you to know the mysterion. I want you to understand the hidden things. I want you to receive revelation on the kingdom so that you can know what the Father is doing in the earth. How will we ever manifest thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven if we never get to understand what God wants out of heaven? Herein is the 70, the I represented. Revelation, God wants you to understand what's happening in the kingdom. So he wants to release revelation. He says it's given to us. It was given to us before the foundation of the world. It is a gift to you to understand what God is doing within each time and within each season. So listen, he does not want the believer, the kingdom dweller, to walk around in spiritual blindness. So Matthew 13 records this for us, and we begin to understand that God wants us to understand what's happening in the kingdom. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that we also want to look at Matthew, um, Matthew 10. We're going to look at Matthew 10, and we want to drop down to about verse, uh, the context about probably about 14 to 16, and we want, to, we want you to understand this particular verse. Now, we're building our case for A.N. Tet, A.N. Tet. He wants us to understand. He wants us to know the revelation because watch this. He's got us on a mandate and a mission. He's got us on a mandate 
and a mission. And in this year, as we close out this century, as we close out this century, we are going to move the kingdom like never before. Here's the crux of it. Matthew 10, verse 5 through 15. Let's read this context and we're going we're gonna to get you to understanding what's going to happen for you in this year. Listen, verse 5 begins, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded. This is an apostolic ministry. He says, these 12 he sent forth and he commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into, the, into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, watch this, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now remember Matthew 13 says, I want you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. The mysteries of the kingdom, the mysterion of the rule and reign of heaven in the earth. Matthew 10 says, watch this, that I want you to go forth and here's what you're supposed to be preaching. You should be preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is here, but do you see it? Can I challenge you with that question right now in our discussion? The kingdom is here, but can you see what's happening from heaven to earth? Open your eyes, open your eyes, open your eyes, A-N. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. He says, I'm freely giving you the revelation of the kingdom. Now you freely give the revelation of the kingdom to the world around you. Hallelujah. Watch this. He said, provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither coats, neither shoes, neither, nor yet stays. For the workman is worthy of his meat. He says, the gospel is going to feed you. You're worthy of it. Watch this. And in whatsoever city that you shall enter, inquire not, inquire who, who in it is worthy, and thereby till ye go thence. And when you are coming to a house, salute it. And if that house be worthy, let your peace, your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. So he gave the disciples the ability, the strength, the spiritual uh, capacity to impart peace to a home. He says, if you come into a house and they won't receive the kingdom, don't leave peace there. Let them stay in turmoil until they become kingdom people. But he says, if they will receive the message of the kingdom, and he's talking out of Judah to, to him, them going to the lost sheep of Israel, going to the Jews. He says, listen, if they'll receive this peace, this gospel of peace, this king of kings and lord of lords, then you pronounce peace upon them. Now watch this. Verse 14 says, um, and, and, and whosoever shall not receive you, he says, listen, I want you to shake the dust off of your feet. Shake the dust off your feet. He says, take no remnant of that place with you. He says, shake it off of your feet. And he says, I want you to keep it moving. He says, and this is what you got to understand. It's going to be hard on them in the last days. It's going to be hard on them in the last days. And he says, listen, I want you to understand, listen, you're going forth on my mission and I'm sending you forth. I'm giving you power to do certain things. And I want you to go forth with my mission. Now watch what he says here in verse 16. He says, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore, watch this, wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. He says, I want you wise as a serpent. But I also want you as harmless of a, as a dove. Now, uh, he says to the believer, to the disciples who are going forth on this apostolic journey, I need you to have this attribute from a snake. A-N, tet, revelation, and, 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 and the snake himself, the subtlety of the snake. Now watch this. In, in, in biblical context, the serpent represents several things. Uh, it not only represents evil, a lot of times we only think that the serpent represents evil, but it represents much more than that. And we're going to talk about that in this broadcast and maybe a couple more down the road. We're going to talk about what he really represents. But one of the things that he represents, watch this, is not only evil, but he also represents wisdom. Notice the context. He says, I want you to be as wise. I want you to be as wise as Big Mama's wise sayings. No. 
I want you to be as wise as your pastor. No, that's not what he says. He says, I want you to be as wise, as intelligent, as, in, as prudent, as mindful as a snake would be. I want you to be as wise as a serpent and yet be as harmless as a dove. So he gives us this positive attribute of, of, of an animal a, a, a creature that most of us have disdain for. Most of us don't like snakes. We don't like serpents. They've always, we, we've always been taught, kill the snake, kill the snake. But, but Jesus says in context, there's something that this serpent has that I want you to get from him. And I want you to get his wisdom. And so we have to understand, watch this, that in this prophetic season, in this next year of 5779, that God is going to open your eyes, watch this, to the revelation of the snake. He's going to help you see in, the next, in this next year, watch this, all of the enemy's plans, because that's one aspect of the serpent. He'll help you to see evil. He's not going to let you get caught up in diabolical plans. He's not going to let you be taken care of, but he's going to give you a wisdom. Here's the positive attribute, the good and the evil of this serpent. He says, I'm going to give you prudence. I'm going to give you intelligence and I'm going to give you wisdom to see the enemy's plans and to have a strategic plan on how we're going to conquer him. Hallelujah. A-N Tet, I'm opening your eyes, your spiritual understanding, so that you can see the enemy's plans in your life. As a result, as a result, you have to consider your heart. Notice he said in Matthew, uh, Matthew, thir Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew 10, he says, I want you to be as wise as a serpent, but I want you to be as harmless as a dove. This word harmless here, watch this, means that you're pure. You don't have evil in you. You're free from guile. So watch this. Here's going to be the challenge for the believer in this next season. You're going to have to be, you're going to have to be able to discern and see evil. That evil may show up in your children. That evil may show up in your church. That evil may show up in a friend that's seeking to betray you. That evil may show up in diabolical plans on your job, in the workplace. That evil may show up in your best friend that you thought was your best friend, who had another best friend, who's telling you all the things you tell your best friend, and you find out you're not their best friend, so everything you're trusting with your best friend becomes their best friend's information. Oh, yes. It may be that you have to go through deception and betrayal this year. But what's going to be so important to us in the kingdom is how do we respond? How do you respond to accusation? How do you respond to political unrest? How do you respond to, to, to ethnic issues? How do you respond as the kingdom? Can you respond in wisdom? I'm sorry, with wisdom as a strategy. Watch this. But harmlessness as the status of your heart. Can you see evil being perpetrated on you? Can you see people coming at you and watch this? Look to the kingdom principle on how you're going to respond. Can you pray for those who are going to despitefully misuse you? Help me, Holy Ghost. I feel your presence. Can you pray for those? Can you do good? Can you return good? For evil, knowing this, that watch this, that God is going to, watch this, control the evil even as he controls the good. Can you be as wise as the serpent, but as harmless as the dove? So in this season of A.N. Tet, in this year, he's going to open up Revelation. He's going to let you see the enemy, but he's going to give you strategy to move in wisdom on how to handle the enemy's attack. See, one of the other things about this year, as, 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 as Matthew 13 records, the, the year, this year, this, really this decade, you should have been waking up spiritually to hear more and to see more spiritually. Now, now, now let me say this to you, as I said to, to Impact a few Sundays ago, your first battleground is going to be self. <laughs> yes, God may show you some things about you, that you need to correct in your life. He may sow you strongholds and footholds in your life that you've got to take captive by the obedience of Christ and bring every thought, every thought 
captive to the obedience of Christ. You got to get your mind right. Now, one thing that's, that, 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 that's worse than anything, <laughs> watch this. There's, that, when, you, when, you're, when you're in the military, there's only a few, a few things that can bring you off of the battlefield. There are certain injuries that, that bring you off of the battlefield because there are some injuries, watch this, that you, learn how, that you learn how to fight with and fight through. There are other injuries that will limit your ability as a soldier to fight a good fight. The first thing, watch this, is the loss of vision. When you lose your vision, you can't even see the enemy. So you can't fight. So you've got to have, watch this, you've got to be able to see the enemy to deal with what you have to come against. And if you can't see him, then you can't fight him. Let's move this over to the spiritual side. If you can't see the enemy's tactics, a n t e t revealing of the snake in the grass, this is the year of revealing the snake in the grass. If, if we can't see what the enemy's doing, then we don't know how to war against it. If you can't see that enemy acting up in your children, you don't know how to pray. If you can't see that enemy taking hold through depression on your husband and your wife, you don't know how to pray. What do you see? The next thing that'll pull a soldier off the, war, off the battlefield is if he loses, watch this, an important limb. So if he loses a leg or an arm, then he has to come off the battlefield because he's now incapacitated. He can't wage war skillfully on one leg. Amen. He can fight to the death if he's injured, but he cannot re-enter to fight another day. Hallelujah. And finally, watch this. If he loses his mental capacity, if he loses his mind, he cannot be on the battlefield. He cannot fight. So in this season, watch this. The Bible says here in Matthew, in Matthew 13, that the issue with the people was they had lost their seeing, they had lost their hearing, and they had lost their heart. Their heart had grown dull. And in this season, God wants to wake you up. Revive you, renew you for a n t e t You're going to have to fight a fight like you've never fought before. But what the Father wants to do is ensure that you are properly equipped for the battle, O oh soldier. So in this year 5779, the year of a n t e t He's going to open up your vision. He's going to help you see what you've never seen before. You're going to see revelation and strategies come forth. Because one of the major things you're going to have to deal with this year. is your, your time as an intercessor and in prayer. And we'll talk about that in another session. But what we want to understand, a n t e t is bringing us the year of the eye and the serpent. The eye and the serpent. So which side of the serpent are you going to fall on in this year? Are you going to be that person that is a perpetrator of evil? Or are you going to be that person who has the wisdom and the prudence and the heart for God to trust you with kingdom revelation? Listen, again, this is Keith Moore. God bless you. Let me, let me pray for you just for a moment before we leave. Father, we pray now that you would bring understanding to your people. That, Lord God, in this year, you're going to send us forth with the wisdom of the serpent, but the harmlessness of the dove. We thank you for that key to discipleship. We thank you, Lord God, that you're sending in, watch, oh God, you're sending in new souls. new people to be a part of what you're doing in this kingdom season. We thank you now for your revelation as it goes forth in your people. We ask you to open up the eyes of their discernment. Help them to mature and understand and see the kingdom by reason of exercise. Even as you said of your children in the book of Hebrews, that they learned, they matured, and they gained discernment by reason of exercise. So, Father, help us to see the enemy. And then, Father, give us the strategies to deal with everything that comes against us. Help us to have financial strategies and family strategies and marriage strategy and kingdom strategy on how we're going to advance the kingdom in the earth. Let each mountain of our lives represent you well. through our families, through our finances, through, through our jobs, occupationally, whatever, wherever we stand, Father God, we need your strategy. So release God, a n t e t unto us in this prophetic season, that we may see the enemy, the snake in the grass, and have revelation on how to handle it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen again, this is Keith Moore of Impact Christian Church, a Kingdom Agenda Fellowship. We thank you for joining us for this session of the Kingdom Agenda. And we welcome you to join us on our next session when we'll be sharing more about this year of a n t e t We say unto you, God bless you, shalom, shalom, and be in peace.
Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Pritchard. station for smooth hits from the 80s, 90s, and today. 104.1 WDLT. Hello everyone, my name is Ross Roberts and I want to personally invite you to something really special going to happen here in, in Mobile at the Mobile Marriott January 24th, 25th, and 26th. This is going to be what we call Streams of Ministry. I'm bringing together some of the most wonderful ministries in the world to right here in Mobile. We're going to begin Thursday night at 6 o'clock with School of the Spirit. We're going to be teaching on the Holy Spirit, how to flow with the Holy Spirit, the anointing. It'll be a delightful time. But at 7 o'clock, we're going to begin what we call Streams of Ministry. And all of these ministries, Cindy Black, Bruce Black, the Durants, Many other people, Gentrin Gell and uh, Scarlett Stevenson, David Horton, myself, Joey and Kirsten Roberts from Portland, Texas. We're going to all be together in one big meeting. And it's going to be a meeting that we're just flowing in. There won't be a scheduled time for different people to preach. We're just going to flow together. If you've never been in anything like this before, I guarantee you, you're going to walk out of me and say, man, I don't know what happened to me in there. God touched me in this meeting. It's going to be a lot of fun, great music. David Sauger from Benny Hinn's ministry is going to be with us with his band and uh, singers. And we're just going to worship Jesus and have a great time. You're invited. I want you to come. Thursday night will begin at 6, all day Friday, and then Saturday from 9 until noon. We'll be out by noon on Saturday. That's the Mobile Marriott, January 24th, 25th, 26th. Come be with us. We're going to have a good time. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm excited. You're thinking, I'd like a little more information. Call me at Ross Roberts Ministries. That's 251-232-6707. 251-232-6707. I'll answer the phone personally and answer any questions you have. I hope you're going to come be with us. We're going to have a great time. Visit KC Photography, serving the Gulf Coast for over 16 years, capturing memories that last a lifetime. Families, children, graduates, weddings, and more. This month's portrait special, 30 free photos for only $24.99. Get your pictures back the same day. KC Photography, 235 South Wilson Avenue, downtown Pritchard. Open on Sundays. Call today, 251 4 Hi, my name is Pastor Wayne Johnson, and we're here today, we're doing a teaching on the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I just want to welcome you to a word, a great teaching that we're going to expound and go into some scripture and kind of lay out a foundation that God wants to reveal himself to us in a different way. And we're here in Walnut Hill where our church is, Emmanuel's Faith Center, and I just want, I want to say thanks for joining us today, and, and I'm excited about what God is doing in these last days. So let's dig into the word of God. And so our foundational scriptures are, are going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start there. And also after that, we're going to go into um, uh, Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the church came. And also we're going to go also in Isaiah 28 verses 11 and 12. And then John 7 and 38. And then we'll end up in uh, Psalms 103 verse 1 through 5. We, we may go a little bit different from those, but these are the foundational scriptures, and you can go back and you can look at them also, you know. And so here we are today, we're talking about the infilling of the Spirit. And so in the beginning, God, you know, gave us his word, and chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians talking about the, the gifts of the Spirit, you know. And so I'm going to read uh, probably maybe down to the first 13 verses, and in, and in between that I may stop and talk a little bit. And so here, here we go. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Not concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. 
Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by what? The Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operation, but it is the same God, which what worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And so, I want to break there. So, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, or the gifts of the Spirit. When we come into that place and the Spirit of God start moving, it's going to profit you. It's going to bless you. It's going to empower you to do some things and break some things and destroy some yokes in your life. So, so when we come to that place and we see the Spirit of God manifesting through prophecy, anytime the gifts of the Spirit in operation, we benefit. You know? And so, so, so here today, when we know that and we start looking for the plan and the perfect will of God to come forth in our life, it's just been a great blessing. Verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, and to by the same Spirit is important. And so it's not three Holy Spirits, it's only what? One Spirit. And so we, as we understand that, it's only one Spirit, but yet still omnipresent, um, all-knowing God. And, and so he can do, he can, he's multitasking millions of things all at the same time because what? He, he is the great and almighty God. And verse 9, to another faith by the same spirit, and to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, and to another the working of miracles, uh, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongue, to another interpretation of tongue. And so I ask you a question. So if God can fill me with the spirit that I pray in tongues, which is one of the gifts of the spirit that's, that's listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, so why shouldn't all the other gifts be? be allowed to be in the church, glory be to God, or be a uh, manifestation come. Because verse, verse 1 said, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And so he said, he told us to desire these gifts, to crave these gifts, to pray and ask God for the gifts to be alive in the church, glory be to God. And so when we do that, we release our faith in the ability that when we pray that we know that our Heavenly Father has what hurt us. And so when we go to Matthew chapter 6, he's talking about the Lord's Prayer. And when we pray in secret, our Father who sees in secret will reward us what openly. And so we see that, 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 that the Lord's Prayer is a very powerful prayer when you go in and you see it. Now you begin to pray from that standpoint of understanding that when we ask God for something, he's not trying to withhold anything from us because we are his seed. We are, the, we are his children. We are the seed of Abraham. And so God wants to empower us to be a blessing to our generation. Because when people are blessed by the gifts and by the power of the Holy Spirit, what's, what, what's, what's the results of it? They want to run toward God. They want to release and give their lives to Christ, glory be to God, that they can live what the abundant life that God what already promised his children. But then I, I begin to ask the question, why is it not given? Why is it so that, we, that some gifts are harder to walk in than others? And, and so that's my prayer to God, that, that the eyes of our understanding will become open, that we can understand how to receive the blessing of God. Salvation and, and receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you know, and so, so power is in the blessings of the Lord. And so anytime the Lord told me he would profit me and increase me and bless me, glory to God, that means there's power in his word to do exactly what he said. And so my job is to believe what I read not rationalize it, not try to say what if, or, and, and not understanding the full measure of what he's trying to relate to the church. And, and, and so when we put that if in there and we disqualify ourselves as being a recipient or, or the receiving the blessing of God, it calls us to stumble and fall. Glory be to God. Does that make sense? And so here today that we know that it's the self-same spirit, one spirit. And, and, and so we have so many Spirits that's trying to gain access to our lives, but they don't, but they are disembodied spirits. They're not what here legally, so therefore they're trying to gain access to our lives and to all that we have, you know. And so we, we, we disfranchise ourselves. We, we, we push them aside in the mighty name of Jesus. Glory be to God. And so hereby we know that, that we have access with God because it, it's by the Holy Spirit. It's only one. 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 One, one, one. one. And so here we are. Let me go back to verse 11. But all these work of that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. 
and they call him in the Greek Allos Paracletus. I, I guess I'm pronouncing that right, you know. And so he's our advocate, he's our helper, he's our standby, he's our intercessor. And, jo and John was said this when, when he had his earthly ministry. He said, there's one standing among you now shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So Jesus baptizes, it's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit comes to give us utterance and unctions in the Spirit. So when he comes upon us, he comes to what fill this, this temple or this void on the inside. And the Bible said, out of our belly shall for what rivers of living water. And so this process is given by faith when you want Jesus to come into your life and let him be Lord of your life. And as you surrender and as you pray and ask God for his blessing to come into your life, he won't withhold none of these gifts because they're gifts. And, then, and if I have a gift, if I want to give you a gift, it's up to you to receive the gift. See, the gift giver is always given, but, but the person that received the gift, he has option. He can what, choose to receive it or reject it. And so a lot of times, and so sometimes we, we, somebody give us a nice gift, oh, you didn't have to do that. Oh, I, I didn't think I was worthy enough to receive the gift. But, but God's opinion of us is that we are what? We're, 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 we're highly favored. And he, he put us on a pedestal because what? Jesus died and suffered and went through so many things on the cross that we can receive the blessings or the gifts or the power and enter into a rest in this time and season that we live in in our life. And so the Bible said we're not destroyed because of the devil. We're destroyed because of the lack of knowledge and insight into his word, Hosea 4 and 6. And so the time that we spend in this word, understanding and receiving and believing God and trusting him. See, patience means when you got to have patience. You know, I, you know, I didn't really understand patience. Patience is when you're standing on God's word and something is trying to move you off the foundation of his word that you're standing on. You need patience or endurance to keep the same mindset and believe God and trust him through that what pressure time that the enemy is placing on your life to move you off your foundation of faith. And so praying in the spirit strengthen us in these weak moments that we are going through in life. That's why we need to be what filled with the spirit praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah to Jesus because you know you're in conflict. You're in a spiritual warfare. You're in a spiritual battle. And as God has gifted the church with one of the greatest gifts that we can, if we do not break down. If we begin to understand that God has given us a weapon of warfare with our tongue by praying in the Holy Ghost, glory to God. Many people fight us on this thing a bit of the, of the infilling of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but it's a spiritual weapon. It's a weapon that God has given to the church. But if we don't understand how to use our weapons, we go into battle with what with carnal weapons against a spiritual enemy, and we are sometimes defeated, glory be to God. But when we understand that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is, is spiritual, is kingdom, is, is binding by God's word that he gives us a spiritual language, that we have the power to communicate with our Heavenly Father, and we speak in an angelic tongue as well. The Bible says, though we speak with the tongue of men and of angels, angels and have not what charity that's why the enemy knows that if we are the strong man and we have power in the name of Jesus glory be to God oh Lord have mercy glory be to God see because it's by one spirit and so let, let me let me let me break off and talk about the strong man part because this is vitally important to what we understand so God created Adam from the dust of the ground correct all right so he blew his life or his zoe or his life created in the image of God. And God gave him power and dominion over all the works of his hand. So basically you say Adam was the God of this world. Does that make sense? Do you agree with me on that concept? And so here we are now, you know, Satan rebels against God, kicked out of heaven, him and the third of the angel. And so he finds himself in the earth where Adam is what? The strong man or have what? He's the God of this world, Adam with dominion and power and authority. So Satan has no, he lost his place. So now he subdued the serpent and what gets in the serpent and goes to Eve. But yet still, he plotted probably a long time on how he would get what he wanted from Adam. And so here you are, he goes, talks to Eve and, and said, has God said? So he began to put doubt in her mind about what God said because hallelujah, glory be to God. Does that make sense? And so here he is, he tricks her. And Adam is not deceived, but he willfully give his dominion and power and authority over to Satan. And now Satan becomes the God of what? This world. Glory to God. He becomes the strong man. 
And so here we are, Adam, strong man first, transferred to Satan, and now Jesus Christ come. They call him the last Adam. Oh, you don't hear me. Glory be to God. And God fills him with, or baptizes him with the spirit of the river of Jordan, and the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and God makes a decree. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And so for a long time as I was a preacher, I thought he was just speaking to the people that were at the baptism. But no, he was speaking to all the creation that he made. And he was telling them, he was telling the rocks, he was telling the wave, the sea, the wind, the fig tree, sickness and disease, Satan and every angel and everything that he ever made, glory be to God. He was telling them and making a decree to them that, that these things that had, that, 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 that they understood the voice of God. And he was saying and making a decree, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. And so when he made that decree, everything had to obey the creator. Glory be to God. And so we see sickness had to obey. We see demons. We see fig trees. We see everything that physically Jesus spoke to. Physically, hallelujah, glory be to God. Physical things that he spoke to, hallelujah. Human things that he spoke to. Environmental things that he spoke to. Everything that he spoke to. Even death, when he spoke to death, death had to obey him. And so therefore God's decree and God's word was so found, so profound that what all creation had to obey him. And that's why God give us these things, what we call working or flowing in the realm of the spirit. And so much carnality has entered into the church. Hallelujah, glory to God. We need to return back to the foundation that God has said, hallelujah, glory to God. Uh, does that make sense? And so here we are today. We are understanding that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is spiritual. It's a pure language. It's not defiled like our language. It, when you pray in the spirit, it's no, it's no cursing in that language because it's a pure language given by God to his people. So every other earthly language that man has a part in, it has curse word. It has things that you can say that, that's, that's not a pure language, glory to God. So rambo korabaka. And so therefore God's language is given by the spirit. And when we pray in it, it profits me. It blesses me. But yet and still, sometimes because the mind does not what understand what's going on and it's trying to figure out and trying to understand. So we form an opinion about what God is trying to do in my life. And therefore, sometimes it, it, it interferes and hinders the blessings or the flow of God in my life. Does that make sense? And so God is saying in verse 11, going back to 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 11, he said, but all these work of that what one and self-same spirit divide into every man severally as he will. So these things are divided unto us by what? The Holy Spirit. And so if the Holy Spirit is, is the one that gives and, and imparts these gifts, so who should I ask? I should ask him about what doing the impossible in my life. And so here we are today, you know, we, we, we just got into a short version of this, of this message, but we're going to have part two, part three, and, and maybe part four going into it. Stay tuned for part two of the infilling of the Holy Ghost and praying in the Spirit with the Emmanuel's Faith Center, and I'm Pastor Wayne Johnson. My name is Pastor Wayne Johnson. Welcome to the sec second segment of our teaching, the infilling of the Holy Ghost and the baptism or praying in the Spirit. And so we're excited today to take you into the, the, the second part of it where we begin to talk about the principles of God's Word, empowering us to do what we can't do. Because when we understand who we are and we know that God is with us, we make a decree on the promises and the prophetic Word that the Holy Spirit is the one that what comes to energize or stir up the gifts of the spirit and we talked about in the last segment we talk about that we are the strong men and so if you do not understand this principle about being the strong man so when attacks of the enemy come you you'll start looking at yourself as the weaker one rather than what the strong man and so when we go there and we, we look at Matthew chapter 12, I believe that that's, that's where that comes from, glory be to God. When we look at, at the principles of God's word, that we are the strong men and women of God. And so now the enemy, Satan, Jesus operated on the, the law. 
So from Genesis to, to, to John was the law. And after the resurrection, after he rose again, then that's when we, we, we go back when he rose again in 40 days of teaching to the disciples. And he told them to go and tear into Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. And so when Satan found out that we all going to be millions and billions of people being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that, 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 that rose, that, that pulled Jesus and, and, and rose and, and brought him back to life, hallelujah, when he was in that dead state, glory be to God, that same Holy Spirit now is inside of us, empowering us, giving us the, the, the wisdom, the strength, and the knowledge and the ability to do exactly what Jesus did. Lord have mercy to Jesus. Do, oh, does that make sense? So when we understand this principle, we got to understand who we are. So now my concept is that if I am less than Satan, well then, therefore, sometimes my thinking is I cannot overpower someone that's stronger than me. It's like a bully. Most people that bully you, they, are, they think they have strong, they, 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 the contents of their character, it, it, it makes you what feel less than. But Lord, have mercy to Jesus. Let, let me go back, Let me, because I want to lay this down to you. The scripture said, how can you enter into a strong man's house and bind him except you be what stronger than him? I'm paraphrasing, glory to God. And so therefore, Jesus Christ became what? The strong man. Everything that God made obeyed the voice of Jesus Christ. Because, Lord have mercy. Ooh, I feel good today. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. And, and so when we go to uh, Matthew chapter 12 and starting at verse 9, when he departed hence, he went into the synagogue, and behold, there was a man which had what, a withered hand. And he asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might what, accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that have one shepherd, one sheep, and if he fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much more then, how much more then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do what well on the Sabbath day? Then said the man, Stretch forth thy hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was what restored whole like unto what to the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and what a great multitude what followed him, and he healed them all. Now, in this context, later on down, we see where 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 they they uh, they talked about in verse twenty eight. He said, "But this is what they said." And uh, let me go. Let me go right here. Let me go to verse twenty four. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, "This fellow doeth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils." And Jesus knew their what thoughts. Now, let me show you something. That's very important when you're reading scripture. He said he knew their thoughts. So whatever thing you are thinking about, whatever thing you let have access in your thought life, it dominates the, 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 the place and the place that you're trying to go in life. Because your thoughts reveal what, what's really on the inside. Glory be to God. Because the scriptures say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So here we are. Jesus knows our thoughts, even the words we're going to say before we even say them. Glory be to God. So this is vitally important when you, when you go there. And he said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to what? Desolation. So when you become the strong man, and we became the strong man when Jesus rose from the dead on the third day with all power and glory in his hand. Now the thing switch. Now the enemy is trying to spoil our house, trying to get us not to see that we are the strong men and women that God has anointed with his spirit and with his power. Glory be to God. We have been restored back to that rightful place when God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. Uh, does that make sense? Do you, do, do you feel me? Do, do you begin to understand? Now, when I get that concept and that concept is inside of me, then my, 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 my imagine, my image of myself now turns to what God said rather than what I feel and what sense, glory be to God. Does that make sense be true? And it's not true. See, because most people live from a place of perception. What they think determines where they go in life, glory be to God. And, and perception can be wrong and not what related to truth with God's word. So when you think that you can't do anything, let, let me break it down like this. Sometimes when Christians say his name and, and they make that decree out of their mouth, something from down here rises up and resists that which is coming out of their mouth. 
and, and I, can, I can give you an illustration if you follow me. If you make this decree right here, you say, I'll never be broke another day in my life. And when you make that decree and you begin to say that out of your mouth, instantly with a lot, with 99% with of the people that say that, you'll feel something from your lower belly or your inner man rise up and resist that word that just came out of your mouth. That's a faith confession. That's what God said. My barrel marrow will never go empty. I'll never be broke another day in my life. God will supply and sustain me in every area of my life. When you make those faith confessions, then that thing comes up and rises up against you to what reject what just came out of your mouth. That's your core belief. That's what you really believe. And that's why the Word of God tells us to renew our mind. And, and when we renew our mind with the Word, it, it, it delinquishes that voice. And that voice no longer rises up against us when we're starting to decree God's Word. And therefore, a lot of people, when they say the name and they make a decree about Satan, and, and so therefore that thing rises up inside of them, and, 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 and sometimes they get afraid. But I want to let you know today, God's Word is true. you got to settle that in your mind. If it's true and, and the weapon that He's given, in us is is the sword of the spirit is the gifts of the spirit or the holy spirit coming to live on the inside of us manifesting himself through us in a lot of ways by praying in the spirit and delivering and that we speak mysteries unto god that we are created in the image of god and we walk and we do kingdom blessing and kingdom work we communicate with a pure language unto god and therefore that language of the spirit is given it's, it's a blessing it's a gift of god and so therefore when my heavenly father has given Gifted me with something, I cherish it with 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 with, with unconditional gloves, our hands of gloves, glory be to God. Because I understand that He's given me something, and sometimes you can receive something from your father or from our, and you don't even realize the value of what we have, glory to God. And so here we are today, and Jesus is what fighting against demonic powers. Through men, because the scriptures say our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principality and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness and high places. So now, let's go back to Matthew 12. And let me begin to explain about this what position of authority and dominion that God has given us. And now we are what the strong men. So we talked about earlier, the old covenants from Genesis to John, right? And Jesus operated under the old covenant when he was here. And the New Testament came, what, after he died and rose the third day with all power and glory in his hand. Glory be to God. So therefore, now he came back, 40 days of teaching to the disciples. And after that, they all met 500 brethren. And he said, go and tear in Jerusalem till you be endued with what? Power from on high. Glory be to God. And so here we are. Jesus is setting a principle and his word, and he's showing us something if we can what, see this. And listen to what he said. And they, and they were saying some things about Jesus, and the Bible said he what, knew their thoughts in verse 25. And every kingdom, and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall what, not stand. And the Bible says, that's, that's powerful within itself. I'm going to come back to it. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? So we pray the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is, is in heaven. So here we are, kingdom principles are coming to the church through by what mysteries are praying in the spirit. So God said, we speak mysteries unto God. I pray with the spirit, I pray with the understanding. I sing with the spirit, I sing with the understanding. So though we speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, it what profit us nothing. So here we are that we have an opportunity to what see into the kingdom. Lord, have mercy to Jesus. The mysteries of the kingdom are now revealed unto the children of God when we know and go after kingdom blessings and kingdom principles. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That when, when I know who I am in Christ, when I know that God has given me power and authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing and no wise shall what hurt or harm us. That's what God said. And so now we, 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 we know that, that, that thou kingdom come, thou will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, hold on. I'm going to show you something. Listen to what it said. And, and verse 26, I read that. And, and verse 27. If I, he said, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Verse 28, listen to this. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. We pray that Lord's Prayer all the time. Jesus said, if I'm casting out devils by what? The finger of God, the kingdom of God has come unto you. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray that all the time. Glory be to God. And listen to verse 29. Or else how can one enter into a enter into a strong man's house and spoil his good, except he first bind the strong man, then he will what, spoil his house. Glory to God. So we are the people that God called and commissioned us to do. And that's why praying in the spirit is so vitally important. It's a weapon that God has given to the church. So when you go to Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about putting on the whole arm of God. But at the last part, he said, praying always with all prayer in the spirit, you know, petition and supplication unto God, that we speak what mysteries unto God. So when you pray in the spirit, the spirit of God, hallelujah, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So, so the gifts of the spirit are the power of the Holy Spirit. This has been the Emmanuel's Faith Center broadcast with Pastor Wayne Johnson. If this broadcast was a blessing to you, we would like for you to partner with us. You can partner with us with the monthly seed of $25. We are located at 9501 Highway 97, Walnut Hill, Florida. For this and other teachings by Pastor Johnson, please visit our website at www.efcenter.org. Tune in next week for another exciting time in the Word of God. And may God continue to richly bless your lives is our prayer. You're tuned in to Life Television Network, your number one Christian station. Life Television Network, in partnership with WERM 1220 AM. Listen to WERM 1220 AM for the best in Christian music, ministries, and more. We would love to have you come fellowship with us at Word of Life Community Church located at 111 South Florida Street in East Bruton, Alabama. Our service times are Sundays at 10 o'clock a.m. for Sunday school, followed by an 11 o'clock worship service, and on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. for our Power Hour Bible Study. For more information, log on to our website or call 251-456-2652 or 251-809-2887. Welcome to the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teaching you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. Thank you for joining us for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. I'm Charles Capps, and we're going to be talking about on this broadcast the prophetic profile revealed through the Solomon concept. You know, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and the thing that is done is that which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. In other words, already happened in old time which was before us. There's a revelation here, and, and I want to bring it out concerning the rapture of the church, the catching away of the saints. Now, don't let that word rapture offend you. Some folks says it's not in the Bible, but it is in the original Hebrew in a skip sequence uh, in a uh, layered revelation in there confirming the word. It's even in the Old Testament. Uh, it's, it's all through the scriptures, the catching away. We see it in different ways. Uh, comes from a Greek word, rapi, and uh, catching away. It really means rapture, catching away. So don't get bent out of shape over the word rapture. Let's just follow the timeline and how God reveals it through the Solomon concept. Now, let's go over to Exodus. And uh, we find in Exodus, the 10th chapter, something that is very interesting. Uh, you remember the keys, one of the keys of understanding end time events and being able to simulate God's timeline is a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, thousand years a day in certain instances. So here in the 19th chapter of Exodus, let's begin reading with uh, verse uh, 10. 
And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Now, how many days is that? Today and tomorrow? That's two days, isn't it? So this is a, a cue that possibly this has something to do with the 2,000 years, 2,000 years of the church age, two days of the church age. Day is with the Lord, 1,000 years, 1,000 years is a day. Let them wash their clothes, get cleaned up. Why? Be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord's coming down in the sight of all the people. On the third day the Lord's coming down on top of the mountain. Now, let's, let's, let's look at this verse. Be ready against the third day. What was it Hosea said? Talking to Israel, said, The Lord has torn, he will heal us. After two days, he will revive us. In other words, after the church age, God's going to deal with the Jews again. And the third day, he shall raise us up, and we'll live in his sight. <laughs> well, here we go, right here. The Old Testament, 3,000 or so years ago here, we're having an event take place that reveals the rapture of the church or the catching away of the church, how you want to say it. Be ready against the third day. The Lord's come down on sight of all people on Mount Sinai. Now, this was God's people. He was coming down inside of. Now, in this verse... Here's an important thing that I wanted to mention right here. We'll talk about it later. But we found out that every 50th year is a jubilee in, in Israel. And uh, uh, on the other broadcast, we talked about man's days are numbered, are determined, and his number of months are with God, and, and he cannot exceed those bounds. In other words, talking about the days of dominion of the Genesis account. He said, let them have dominion for how long? for evidently 6,000 years. So here we find that in this verse, 11 of uh, Exodus, is the word, the jubilee, in a ELS equidistance letter sequencing. It's like rungs on a ladder. You skip ever so many uh, letters in the Hebrew and it spells the jubilee. So this is a clue that this is a jubilee, and not only a jubilee, this is the jubilee. <laughs> so keep that in mind as we go through this. Now come down to verse uh, 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunder and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a voice of a trumpet exceedingly loud. Now does this sound somewhat familiar to you? to 1 Thessalonians 4, where the Apostle Paul said, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Michael the archangel, shout with the trump of God, blended with the trump of God, sounded like a voice of a trumpet talking. And here is the, the voice of a trumpet exceedingly loud, so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. Now, you remember Moses Moses lived 120 years. Now, see, we've been talking about the days of man's dominion. There's 120 jubilees every 50 year of the jubilee. And 120 jubilees is 6,000 years. There's another interesting event that happened in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost means 50. That's all it means, just 50. And on the day of Pentecost, how many were in the upper room? 120. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, if you multiply those numbers together, what do you get? 6,000. So it seems that God has layered the word with these revelations and numbers, a way they're associated with certain events to give us insight into the fact that it's confirmation of the written Word of God. You don't uh, generate doctrine by numbers. You just simply, the numbers and the way they're associated with events uh, help you with the revelation and the confirmation of it. So here's Moses. He lived 120 years. If you remember, he died and God buried him in the valley of Moab. Now, Moses, evidently, he is, seems to be a profile 
of the righteous dead of 120 jubilees who died before they entered into the promised land of heaven. And uh, it fits in that profile. So here, notice, the third day in the morning, the Lord came, will come down on the mountain. And that's exactly what happened here. The third day in the morning, thunder and lightning, thick clouds, sounds a whole lot like 1 Thessalonians 4. And it said, The Lord himself sent from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Now the dead in Christ shall rise first. Moses' life seems to be a prophetic profile of all the righteous dead of 120 jubilees who died before they entered into heaven. Now, the, you know, you heard probably most of your life up to now that, well, you're not going to get out of this world alive anyway. Oh, yeah. There is a righteous generation and the last generation that will not die but will be caught up alive. And I believe that is this generation. Uh, you can believe what you want to, but I believe it's this generation. But now here, if Moses represents the righteous dead of 120 jubilees, and you, you would say he represents all of the righteous dead, because after the rapture, the righteous, that part of it will never die anymore. They don't have immortal bodies. So you realize we're talking about the righteous dead of 120 jubilees when Moses represents. So he led the people up to meet with God. Now notice how the Holy Spirit uh, had them to write this. Now we know he didn't lead them up on the mountain, but the way it's worded gives you insight into what God is trying to get over to us. The dead in Christ, which Moses represents, led the people to meet with God. Now, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians uh, 16, 4, 16, 17, I believe it is. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Now, another interesting thing. This, when he comes down on Mount Sinai, he realized he doesn't come down to the, what we would call the earth. He, he comes mountaintop high on top of that mountain. Now, in 1 Thessalonians 4, I believe it's 17, where it says, caught up to meet the Lord in the air, the Greek word used there for air is a Greek word that means from ground level to the top of a mountain. Now, you can't get any more accurate than a prophetic profile of the rapture of the church in this verse right here in the Exodus 19. Now, this is, you know, <laughs> and now stop and think about it. This was the first Pentecost, 50 days after they came out of Egypt. This is what is called the first Pentecost. That's when this happened. Well, how many was there at Pentecost in the New Testament? There was uh, 120 in the upper room, and it was 50 days after. Here you have the man that lived 120 years, uh, representing the righteous dead, leading the people up to meet with God, who came mountaintop high. I mean, well, he didn't. they didn't go up on the mountain. He wouldn't allow them up on the mountain. There's some things there we'll not get into. But this is a, a prophetic timeline profile by the Solomon concept revealing that things that happened in days past on the first Pentecost reveals the rapture in a unique way. Now, we can call it catching away if you want, whatever you want to call it, but it's, we're going to be out of here when it happens. Now, let, let's notice here then in verse 16. Again, it came to pass the third day in the morning. Well, now, Brother Caps, how do you... Are you sure that this has anything to do with the rapture? Well, there's a clue right here, and you need to know what it is. If you start with verse 16 in the fourth letter and skip every other letter from the fourth word and skip every other letter from left to right, it spells the Hebrew word betshelhuf. Well, I, th I think I may have got 
got this mixed up with another one. Let's race that off of the, <laughs> to the tape. Let's go on with it. I'll clarify it in just a minute. Now, he said, it came to pass the third day in the morning. The third day in the morning. Isn't that interesting? According to what the, the Scripture tells us about uh, on the third day, he'll raise us up and we will live in his sight. Well, that is interesting, isn't it? Well, I was correct in the first place. It is in this scripture uh, that in the, you start with the fourth, it's found, the word rapture is found in the original Hebrew. And here, I don't know whether you can see that or not, but here's a printout of it in the Hebrew. And it says, the rapture found in the Torah code, the Hebrew phrase, in bet shel hoof. You start with the fourth letter, uh, and the first verse, I believe it is, and you skip every other letter. It's the Hebrew word, bet shel hoof, which means in the rapture. That's what it says. Now, this is embedded in an ELS skip sequence right here. And the skip sequence is two, every other letter, every second letter. And it says, rapture. Now, is that a pretty good clue of what this is revealing? I don't know about you, but that, that, that pretty much uh, convinces me that this is actually the Solomon concept revealing the truth of what will happen in the rapture. Because you have a man that lived 120 years. Of course, he wasn't 120 years old here, but that's how long he lived. He led the people up to meet with God. And that's important to understand because uh, that coincides with what the Apostle Paul said. Now, there was a fellow called me and said, uh, Brother Caps, he said, uh, I have a fellow staying with me. Uh, and he said, he's worked with the Bible computer code uh, for nine years. And uh, some of you have probably read the, the uh, Bible code, the book, the Bible code. Um, now, you have to be careful with that because if you go... And two or three thousand or forty thousand skip sequence, you could have it say anything. But when you find it in ELS skip sequence in short distances, a chapter where it is seemingly referring to an event that could possibly be, and it spells it out in the original Hebrew in a uh, skip dick, uh, ELS skip sequence. Then you have you have some real messages that God's hidden in the Word of God. So I said, uh, check this chapter and see if you can find anything about uh, heaven and and church and and what have you. So here's 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 what he found in an ELS skip sequence. He says, uh, Michael. See, Michael's head of the rapture, uh, charge of the rapture of the church. Michael, he took church into heaven. Now, is that, is that a confirmation of what seems to be said here or, or what? This is embedded in the Hebrew. Michael, he took church into heaven. Now, this is 3,000 years ago, over 3,000 years ago. God has embedded this message in the original Hebrew so that when we read this, the generation that's going to be caught up reads this, we will know what it means. Other generations didn't have this. You remember Paul taught, he said uh, uh, the Lord had given him revelation of other generations didn't understand, but is now being revealed through the apostles and prophets. Well, this is what God's doing to this generation. Why? Because we are the generation that's going to be caught up. So, I don't know whether you believe it or not, but I believe it. It, it seems to be a real confirmation to me of, of what is being said here. It is absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, laying out the prophetic profile of events of the past, what I call through the Solomon concept, that reveals the rapture of the church. And it says it's the third day in the morning. Now that could be, that could be interesting too because of this. Because you see, uh, uh, 
the Hebrew day does not begin in the morning. It begins in the evening. So if, if that has play with this, then it would indicate that there would be a time period from the beginning of the third day till the morning, because the third day, uh, uh, Hebrew day, begins in the evening. So could that be a time slot for the end time harvest and the manifestation of God's power and anointing upon this earth? Seems to me like it could. It, it's at least worth looking into and, and thinking about. So uh, that's important to, to see in the Scripture. Now let's go over to uh, the New Testament because there's some things in this New Testament that will help us understand it better. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, You'll notice in verse 27 says, uh, Jesus says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, then shall he reward every man according to his works. Now we re read from what the Apostle Paul wrote in Corinthians that we are rewarded for our works after we're raptured and we're in heaven. We'll be there seven years before we come back to the earth to rule and reign with Christ. Then in verse 28 it says, Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste death, till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, isn't that an awesome statement? Some of you stand here and won't taste death till you see this. Now, he wasn't talking about that the kingdom would come and Jesus would come in His kingdom. He said, you'll see it. It was a vision. Now, we, uh, chapter 17 says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, up to a high mountain to park, was transfigured before him. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He waited exactly six days. Now remember that one of the keys to understanding the sequence and timing, the end time events, is that a day is with the Lord a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. So Jesus waited exactly six, six days after he made that statement. Then he took Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain. Now remember, it's a high mountain. So here we are, we're on this high mountain again, and uh, there's Jesus. And he's talking with Moses and Elijah. Now, isn't that something? Now, somebody said, well, that couldn't be a profile of the rapture because he only took three people with him, Peter, James, and John. Well, that's one of the clues. Peter, James, and John just happened to be, happened to be, <laughs> the ones he took with him when he went to raise the dead. Have you noticed that in the Scripture? They were called the sons of thunder. And they were with him when he raised the dead. So there's a resurrection. That reveals there's a resurrection of this event. And he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as sun. His raiment was white as light. Now, the only other place you find this is in the book of Revelation that this happens in the New Jerusalem. I believe, personally, they were caught up in the New Jerusalem or the bodily or just in spirit form. I, I don't know. But uh, this vision, they were caught up in this vision, like John the Revelator was caught up into heaven, and they were in the New Jerusalem, evidently. Behold, there appeared Moses and Elias talking, or Elijah talking with them. And uh, now what are we going to say about this? Here's Moses and Elijah talking with them. Now Moses had been dead 1,500 years or 1,700 years at this time, and in the Old Testament, God said it's abomination to try to communicate with the dead. So Moses must be alive, he must be resurrected, or he couldn't be talking with Jesus, or Jesus wouldn't be talking with him because it'd be abomination to God. <laughs> now, isn't that an interesting thought? But then here's Elijah. Elijah represents the church. He was caught up alive and didn't die. Now, you remember Moses died, but he was 120 years old when he died. He represents the righteous dead of 120 jubilees who died before they entered into the promised land. So this is no doubt, in my mind, this is a prophetic profile of the timeline of the rapture or catching away of the church, and they lived it out in reality in a vision form, like John the Revelator did when he was caught up into heaven in, in his vision. Now he's talking to Elijah and Moses 
Now someone said, well, well why is it Elijah and Moses? Uh, some say that, well, Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses, but uh, that Moses doesn't qualify for one of the two witnesses because the two witnesses that prophesy the last three and a half years of tribulation period, they die in the streets of Jerusalem the last three, three days before the end of the tribulation. Now, Moses, if he's been resurrected, he is immortal. He cannot die again, cause, so he cannot die in the streets of Jerusalem. So you can X Moses out of that. Um, but I, personally, I, I believe it's uh, Enoch and Elijah because they have, neither one of them have died. Elijah evidently is still in heaven in, in his uh, natural body probably eating of the tree of life. But anyway, uh, here we find that uh, it says, While they yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice came out of the cloud, said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Now notice, the cloud overshadowed them, and the voice came out of the cloud. Now here's an interesting thought, that uh, when Peter uh, tells about this later, in I think it was First Peter, he says, this voice we heard came from heaven. Well, they must have been in heaven then because it came out of the cloud and the cloud overshadowed them. So they must have been in heaven and the cloud was in heaven and overshadowed them and the voice came out of heaven. So that seems to be more uh, in line with what it says here, that they were caught up into the new Jerusalem probably and... Uh, then uh, you know that Jesus said, tell this vision to no man till the Son of Man be raised from the dead. Well, this is quite a startling event that happens in the New Testament. Now, remember the Solomon concept, Ecclesiastes 1, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, thing that is done, it is that which shall be done. And here's Jesus laying it out so plain that, that no one could miss it, at least when the revelation comes forth. We missed it for years. But when the generation comes on the scene that's going to be caught up, the revelation flows freely. So here it is. It's laid out. He waited six days. Now Luke says after about eight days, but you notice the word about. He didn't count them. <laughs> it was six days. Uh, Mark, I believe it's Mark and Matthew said it was six days. So Jesus waited six days. Why? Because it is a prophetic profile through the Solomon concept revealing this event that, that happened here reveals the rapture of the church. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that, that's exciting to me to know that God is able to reveal these things the way he does. Now, before I leave the broadcast, our book offer, again, this week is book offer number 2522. It's called End Time Events, Journey to the End of the Age. It's a 269-page paperback, and it's also the revised edition. We've, we've put some things in there about uh, that didn't get in the hardback book. It's $15 plus $4 postage and handling, and we have a toll-free order line. It's 1-877-396-9400. And uh, you can also order uh, w, uh, by internet, www.charlescaps.com, and uh, you can do your order on the internet. That 800 number again is 1-877-396-9400. Now, in this book, we have these uh, prophetic profiles laid out in here, and also this skip sequence on this event that happened in Exodus 19. It's all in here. You can see it in the original Hebrew and how it's laid out. And it'll give you uh, the insight. And uh, also, here's, here's a page that it, it gives you some skip sequence that we found in 2 Kings. And uh, it's interesting how these things show up in the Scriptures. There's no doubt about it. God is revealing to this generation what other generations didn't know. But this book will take you on a scriptural journey revealing the sequence and timing of end time events in a way that uh, most people never thought of, and I know I didn't until the Lord revealed it to me. Uh, it's through the Solomon concept. Until next time, this is Charles Capps reminding you that the enemy is defeated, 
God is exalted, and Jesus is coming soon. To order a copy of today's show or any product offered on this program, call 1-877-396-9400 or visit our website at caps.tv where you can order downloads of our MP3 teachings, ebooks, and watch other programs on demand. This broadcast has been sponsored by Caps Ministries and is dedicated to helping you put the Word of God to work in the everyday circumstances of your life. Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Pritchard. Welcome to Taking the Kingdom with Samuel and R.C. Blakes Jr. This is an outreach of the new home family of churches. Taking the Kingdom is the prophetic ministry of Bishop Robert Blake Sr. since 1964. Today, the mantle and mission has passed to his sons, R.C. Blakes Jr. and Samuel Blakes. Together, they are bringing the full gospel to a world dead in religion, teaching the word of God to the saints, raising up powerful churches, and demonstrating the power of the spirit to a world in bondage. Put Satan on notice. We are... Taking the kingdom. Blessings and favor to you, my friends. What a blessing and privilege it is uh, to be able to come into so many living rooms, hospital rooms, bedrooms, uh, wherever you are, even to those who are behind prison bars. I got good news for you. You may be locked in, but the Holy Ghost is not locked out. God can reach you right where you are. Thank you for tuning in. You are tuned in on the right day for the right word. God has a word that is divinely orchestrated and designed to bring change to your life. I want you to sit back, fasten your seatbelts. We're going into the sanctuary of New Home Ministries, and uh, God's getting ready to bless you. Let's go in. God bless. Not going to be long, I promise. I preached hard in Baton Rouge, so, you know, such as I have, give I unto thee. Joshua 3 and 5. Uh, I want to talk to you just for a few minutes. God tells Joshua to tell the people something that is so important as they get ready to cross over into a different arena, as they get ready to cross over. Um, their crossing over really symbolizes our crossing over tonight. And God tells Joshua to tell the people something. And as Joshua told them, I tell you tonight. In Joshua 3 and 5, the Lord simply said this. He said, uh, through Joshua, he says, Joshua told the people to sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will work wonders among you. Different version says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Sanctify yourselves. If you don't mind, touch them and tell them, neighbor, tell them as you go into this new year, the word is very simple. Tell them, sanctify yourself. And what is sanctification? Sanctification is the process of, by which you and I uh, become more like our God. It ought to be the desire of every believer you know, somehow the desire, Pastor Payton, of the, of the believer has been watered down in the church today. And what we desire are temporary things. We desire, we come to church and we come to God looking for cars, houses, and things. But the ultimate desire of every believer should be to live and lead a sanctified life. 
Can I tell you something about sanctification? Sanctification is not what you think it is. Uh, when I was a kid, there was a certain church that we passed by, and, and when we passed by, we'd say, that's that sanctified church. That's that sanctified church. How many of y'all remember that? That's the sanctified church. Uh, and we called them sanctified because they wore long dresses and tied their heads up and didn't wear makeup. And we said, that's the sanctified church. But the truth is, sanctification has nothing to do with what you got on you. It has everything to do with what you have in you. And the sad reality is many of us are dressed up on the outside while we're messed up on the inside. And as a kid, we always said, that's that sanctified church. And the truth is, every church ought to be a sanctified church. If you don't mind, tell somebody, tell me, I want to be a part of a sanctified church. Sanctification is... Our gift back to God. God gives us our lives. And sanctification is literally us giving that life back to God. Saying, now Lord, you take me and you make me what you want me to be. Joshua tells the people, he says, this is the prerequisite. He says, man, can I just talk to y'all tonight? He says, God wants to do amazing things for you, amazing things in you. God wants to do amazing things through you, but this is the prerequisite. You got to sanctify yourself. Now, uh, uh, we understand that, you know, we cannot sanctify ourselves, but what we can do is, is prepare ourselves for the sanctification process. God does the work. We make the preparation. I'm going to say it again. God, Everybody say it with me. Say, God does the work. But look at somebody tell me, I got to make the preparations. Now, how do I prepare myself to be sanctified? Because I really want God to do these wonderful things. How many of you need God to do something special this year? Wait a minute. Anybody in here need God to do something special? In? How many of y'all need something at your house? Come on, if you don't, lift your hand because I'm coming home. I need God to show up for me in a very special way. I need God, Dr. Payton, I need God to work wonders for me. And Joshua said the prerequisite is this. He says you do what you're supposed to do, and when you do what you're supposed to do, you ignite the hand of God to do what he's supposed to do. So the preparation is up to me. How do, I, how, do I, how do I prepare to live a sanctified life? First thing, write this down. First thing I got to do is I got to understand that sanctification happens through the rigorous study of the word. I got to get in the word. And the word's got to get in me. I got to get in the word. The word's got to get in me. Can I tell y'all something? Your entire experience with the word cannot just be what you get from me on Sunday and Tuesdays. Huh? The only time you read your Bible cannot be when I tell you turn here or turn there. You got to do what Paul admonishes Timothy to do when he says study. Show yourself prove a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Everybody say, I got to study. I got to get in the word and the word has to get in me. See, because when the word gets in me, the word begins to change my appetite for sin. A lot of y'all wondering why you can't win your battle against sin and you can't kick your habits and you can't overcome your struggles, it might be because you ain't got no word in you. Y'all ain't got quiet on me. Do you know Jesus prayed right before going to the cross and this is what he prayed. Sanctify them through your truth. 
listen to what he says in John 17, 17. He says, sanctify them through your truth because your word is true. He says when the word comes in, the word demands sanctification. It is impossible, brothers and sisters, to stay under the word without your life changing. That's why I tell people when, you know, I, 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 at one point I had members who were running folk out of the church because they didn't like the way they were dressed and didn't like the way they were coming to church. And I told them, let them keep, let them keep coming. <laughs> Listen, and this is why you let them keep coming. You let them keep coming and let them stay under the word. And as the word comes in, you're going to discover dress codes are going to change. Mindsets are going to change. Listen, you haven't always been where you are. Huh? And, and the only reason you are where you are is because the word took up residence on the inside of you and changed you. And the same word that changed you is going to change these young people. If you don't mind, just tell somebody, tell them, tell them, leave me alone and let the word work on me. Because sanctification is a process. You know, the Bible says that you and I, like newborn babies, like newborn babies, we should crave the sincere milk of the word. Like a baby craves the bottle, you ought to crave the Bible. A baby craves the bottle so much that he's thinking about that bottle when he's sleeping. That's how that mama knows. Slip, slip that bottle. Huh? In, the, in his sleep, he starts thinking about the bottle. You ought to crave the word of God so much that in your sleep, you start thinking about the word. And as you, as you Think on the things of God, the word begins to change your heart, begins to change your mind, and it begins to change your nature. Talking to somebody in this room, the problem with some of y'all, man, is uh, you, you've gotten too comfortable. And you've forgotten the things that got you saved. You've forgotten the things that got you delivered. You first got saved, you were on fire, calling everybody, talking about what Bible should I, should I buy? Now you don't read none of them. Y'all ain't got to say nothing to me. I'm going to talk. And I'm going to talk just like I feel. I ain't straining nothing. You and I, like the alcoholic craves the bottle, the wordaholic ought to crave the Bible. When I come to church, I should not come for entertainment. I should not come just for excitement. I wish I had some help in now. See, the problem with a whole lot of y'all is you want to dance to the music, you want to clap to the choir, but you want to sleep on the message. And the only thing that is going to save you is the word of God. The only thing that is going to change you is the word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word. Like I feel, I dare you to touch somebody. Tell them, I got a word for you. Tell them if they don't sing one note, if the musicians don't play one note, if they don't sing one song, just give me a word that's going to change my heart and change my mind and change my desires. So if I'm going to be sanctified, first thing I got to do is I got to, I got to, I got to rigorously study the word of God. When's the last time you picked up your Bible outside of church? Huh? When's the last time you picked up your Bible and, and wasn't nobody standing over you talking about turn here and turn there? And, and look at this, and look at that. When's the last time you took the initiative to get in your word for yourself? Nothing changes you like the word. Listen, um, the second thing that has to happen if you're going to walk in sanctification, write this down. Second thing is, you need a rigorous prayer life. problem with some of y'all is you're studying but you ain't praying. 
you read your Bible, but you don't talk to your God. And, and get this, when you read your Bible and you don't talk to your God, you don't understand what you read. It's quiet up in here. See, listen, you got to have a prayer life. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm preaching just like this. Jesus said to his disciples, before he went to the cross, listen to what he says to them. He says, watch and pray. Why, why do you want me to watch and pray? It's in Mark 14 and 38. He says, watch and pray. Why do you want me to watch and pray? He says, you need to watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Why do you want me to watch and pray so that I don't fall into temptation? He says, because your spirit is willing. Your flesh ain't come on. How many, how many honest folk do I have in this room that will admit your flesh is, is still a mess? I dare you to tap somebody, tell them, neighbor, I got a word for you. Tell them my flesh is still a mess. Huh? You know, some of y'all want to act like once you got saved, you know, uh, men don't look good and women don't look good. The devil is a liar, they look better. But just touch somebody, tell them, neighbor, I got a word for you. Tell them that's why I need something on the inside to help to control my outside because my spirit is willing but my flesh is weak. So he said, look, he says, you got to have a prayer life. Jesus had previously told Peter and, and the other disciples that they would deny him. He had already told them they would deny him. However, Christ also taught them how not to fall to the temptation. But the problem was, when it was time to pray, they wanted to sleep. I, I'm going to say it again. The problem was, when it was time to pray, they wanted to sleep. And listen, there's something you will note about prayer. This is what I want you to think about. You know, some folks say, well, don't don't matter how long you pray. Sometimes it does. See, there's some stuff you're going to go through. Now I lay me down to sleep. I ain't going to. That, look at somebody tell me, that ain't going to get, that ain't going to get this one. See, see, these kind come out, Jesus says, by fasting and praying. See, sometimes you're going to have to labor in prayer. Jesus said to them, no, this can't be no 15-second prayer. He says, I need you to watch with me for one hour. I need you to spend an hour in prayer. Because if you pray in private, you'll have power in public. Some of y'all ain't got no power in public because you won't do no praying in private. That's why when you get up and sing, we hear you, but we don't feel you. Can I preach like I feel? Touch somebody, tell neighbor, tell them I got a word for you. Tell them you need a prayer life. You need a discipline of prayer. You need a discipline of prayer. You need to pray every day. The Bible said men ought to always pray. And the reason you need to pray every day is because you're trying to break spirits off of your life that been on you for 20 and 30 years. They needed a disciplined prayer life. This prayer was not quick. This prayer was disciplined. And Jesus prayed for an hour, but he could not get them to watch with him. This is, the, this is the sad thing about the average church in America. The average church in America can get a thousand folk in a musical and can't get ten folk in a prayer meeting. you will never have and I'm talking to you like this because I want you to get this you will never have a sanctified life without a prayer life if you don't mind touch somebody and ask them when was the last time you prayed listen Jesus says that if you pray you won't fall let me ask you, how many times in 2018 have you stumbled? 
stumbled into frustration, stumbled into depression, stumbled into anger, stumbled into pride, stumbled into lust because you were not disciplined in your prayer life. If, if, we're, if we're not going to succumb to temptation, we must find time and space to pray. I wish I had some. If, if my people, called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and then I will hear from heaven brothers and sisters if you and I are going to experience sanctification we got to do the preparation. Uh, we got to pray. We got to study. We got to pray. Third thing, we got to have, if we're going to live sanctified lives, write this down. You got to have godly fellowships. If you don't mind, look at somebody and ask them who you're rolling with. Who are the fellows on your ship? We've done all our shouting. I want to talk to you tonight. A lot of y'all have friendships that are ungodly. You are connected to people who have no God consciousness. You're, you're connected to people who have religion without relationship. But according to Proverbs 27 and 17, he says, iron sharpens iron. And a man ought to sharpen the countenance of his friend. If you don't mind, catch somebody's hand, look them in the eye, and ask them, do your friends make you better? As a matter of fact, touch the friend you came with tonight and ask him, do you make me better? Are you a benefit or are you a detriment? Are you building me or are you breaking me? Are, are you a blessing or are you a burden? Because sanctification often happens through fellowship. You show me who you're rolling with, I'll show you where you're going to. Y'all ain't got to say nothing to me. And a lot of y'all are crazy enough to think you can lay down with dogs and you ain't going to catch fleas. Joshua says to those people, he says, sanctify yourself because tomorrow... Sanctification, I got to get in the word. The word has to get in me. I got to have a prayer life. Thirdly, I need godly fellowships. Who, who are your accountability brothers and sisters? Who do you have in your life that calls you? Let, let me ask you this. Do you have any friends in your life that calls you just to pray? Now, I know you got something that call you to gossip. I know you got something that will call you and serve up the tea. Y'all looking at me, but I don't know whether you're feeling me or not. Do you have anybody in your life that will call you, and when you pick up the phone, they say, girl, I just called you to pray. Close your eyes. Many of us, brothers and sisters, are in fellowship with the wrong people and consequently because uh, you hang with your old crew, you never experience a new you. What about your company? 
accountable to? Who, who holds you accountable? L l listen, brothers and sisters, it ought to be your aim to develop Christian friendships. There's a problem, listen, listen, there's a problem when you're in a new place and you ain't got no new friends. Ain't none of your friends, didn't none of your friends come to church with you or nothing? And the one you brought sleep? Hunch him right now, tell him, wake up, wake up. That man talking about you, come on, hunch him, tell him, wake up. Listen, listen, I'm almost done. Your fellowship has a lot to do with where you go as a believer. In fact, this is the primary method of spiritual discipline. Uh, Paul had in mind when he was addressing the, the Philippian church, uh, he, he, he has in mind fellowship. When he talks to the Philippian church, uh, he talks of, to them about their connections and their, their, their covenants. He talks to them about who they are connected to. Because your connection can propel you or your connection stifle you. Some of y'all need to make up your mind right now. Some of the relationships you I know you enjoyed the word today. Um, it's amazing how God can tailor a word uh, to fit your situation. Somebody, while I was teaching the word of God today, you were saying to yourself, this man is talking to me. He is talking to me. He is talking about me. But I want you to know it was not me talking to you. It was not me talking about you. It was God speaking to your heart, your mind, and your spirit, letting you know that he knows your dilemma. He knows where you are. He knows your situation. And if he knows about it, he can do something about it. I'm so excited. I'm so excited about God, I'm excited about what's getting ready to happen for you. Uh, amazing things are getting ready to happen for you. Amazing doors are getting ready to open. God's getting ready to send provision and protection to your life like you have never seen before. I'm telling you, I'm speaking prophetically that this, my brother, this, my sister, is your time and your turn. God's getting ready to bless you. I want you to sit down. I want you to call the number at the bottom of the screen. There are counselors that are waiting to pray with you and stand in the gap for you. Uh, these are persons who have consecrated their lives simply for the purpose of getting a prayer through on your behalf. So sit down and call the number at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I want to see you in one of our new home locations uh, this Sunday morning. It's going to be amazing. If you're in Baton Rouge, I want to see you in Baton Rouge. That Baton Rouge church is growing by leaps and bounds. People are constantly being added to the fold. Uh, if you're in New Orleans, I want to see you in New Orleans. We have several services that will meet your need. If you're on the West Bank, go and see my brother, uh, Bishop Leroy Phoenix. If you are in Hammond, uh, go and see Pastor Nakia McKay. Uh, there is a new home near you. If there is not one, I promise you there's one coming soon. I love you today. Listen, maybe you're unsaved and you don't know God. Pray this simple prayer with me and God's going to come into your heart. Your life will never be the same. Bow your head, close your eyes and pray this prayer with me. Father God, come into my heart. Take over my life. I surrender my members to you. I surrender my life to you. I ask you now to wash me, cleanse me, make me whole and holy. And I thank you now, God, that I am saved. I am saved. Yes, I'm saved in Jesus' name. I love you, my brother. I love you, my sister. If you prayed that prayer from the top of your heads to the soles of your feet, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. Now what you need is a great place of fellowship. And one single service at New Home Ministries will change your life forever. God bless you. Go with God and watch God go with you.
Are you looking for an accredited school to enroll your child in? If so, then Life Institute Christian School is indeed your school. Life Institute Christian School serves grades K-12 and utilizes an individualized accelerated Christian education curriculum that allows the student to achieve attainable educational goals at his or her own pace. Enrolling your child in Life Institute Christian School will leave them with an experience that they can proudly share with others. Allow your child to obtain a valuable education here at Life Institute Christian School on the campus of Word of Life Community Church. For more information about the school, call 251-456-2652. Word of Life Learning Institute is more than just a daycare. We specialize in the overall development of your child. We utilize an accelerated Christian education curriculum that teaches your children the basics they need for a strong academic future. We provide nursery through K-5 after school care and before and after school transportation. For more information, call 251-456-2650. Word of Life Learning Institute for learning and caring. Chuck three four folks say it's time to change. It's time to change. It's time to change. Change for the better. Tell them change for the better. Change for the positive. Tell them change for your family. Change for your future. It's time to change. 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 Welcome to Power in the Word, the exciting teaching ministry of yours truly, Dr. Henry W. Roberts the second, I am the founder and pastor of the Word of Life Community Church, one church, multiple locations to serve you and your entire family. Right now, I want you to call a neighbor, call a friend, let them know that Power in the Word is on the air, and after this, I'm going to come back and let you know how you may obtain a copy of today's message. So until I should see you again on this air, God bless you and keep you. Get ready to be blessed. So now watch. I told you to go to Hebrews 11 and 6. That what I told you? You see, you thought I forgot. Hebrews 11 and 6. Watch this. So now, the word of faith needs to be coming out of my mouth at all times. I, he, in one place, they put, all, put away all gossip, clamor, evil communication. See, so it's, in order to really receive from God, it's more on me than it is on God. So it's certain things I can't let you pull me into. Even though I love you, but I can't let you pull me into because I got my faith it has to constantly produce. I can't be walking around here mad. I can't walk in unforgiveness. No matter how bad you do me to talk about me, I, I, I can't hold it against you. I got to see you still love you, love your past, what I know, and continue to minister to you. So then, I must make a personal commitment on purpose to do nothing but walk, talk, believe, faith. Hebrews 11 and 6. Let me show you why. Read it? Read it. So now why? Y'all smart. Y'all considerably intelligent. So what pleases God? What pleases God? So when a person not in faith, they're what? They're displeasing to God. So you run around here complaining. Numbers 14, 26. Let's run. Come on. This for somebody. See, that's how important God, you are to God. Don't let nobody tell you you don't mean nothing to God. God erect the preacher's message just to talk to you. See, I got my little paper. I come in here ready. 
But let me show you something else. If this level of word was not in me, if I did not spend time every day praying in the Holy Ghost, four day in the morning up praying, do you know I, he couldn't just pull this up out of me? This is not memory. This is what I walk in. And the only thing I'm trying to convince you of is you don't have to be the preacher to walk in this. You're supposed to walk in this too. Where I tell you to go? 1426. Ready to read. Whoa. Now these God folk, he's brought them out of Egypt. Now he, they've gotten out here and he has to refer to his own folks as evil. He, you in the church and you just, oh, y'all ain't want to say nothing. I'm going to say it again. Help me preach. Help me preach. You want to preach all the time? Tell me what pastor preaching. Huh? Preach now. Come on, preach now. Hear you in the church all the time and God calling these folk evil. Oh, I ain't get enough response. There are too many of us sound louder. Hear you in the church all the time and God calling these folk evil. That's what I want to hear. Because sometimes you can be in the family but don't have the ways of the family. So you far and really from the family. Then sometimes you can be baptized, speak in tongues, and just have some old evil, nasty ways. And the only way you're going to keep those evil, nasty ways and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost is you don't spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. He can't purge nothing out you then. He can't get you in a place where you by yourself and convict you of the stuff about you you need to change. You can find stuff on everybody else, but what you finding on yourself You see all my flaws, but what about yours? Look at three or four saying, I see, you see all mine, but what about yours? Find all the faults you want in somebody else. Oh, but I feel the Michael Jackson song coming on. I'm looking at the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make that change. Oh! <laughs> Church three or four folks say it's time to change. It's time to change. It's time to change. Change for the better. Tell them change for the better. Change for the positive. Tell them change for your family. Change for your future. It's time to change. 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 I mean, I want to make the world a better place. Take a look at yourself. Make that. Hey! Come on, finish read. Mary Hart do good like a medicine. The Lord sit on the throne and laugh at the things the devil do. So if I can get you to get this word with a little gizzard, you know how your grandma used to have to get a little sugar for you to take that medicine? See, so I've been getting you plenty of medicine today. Somebody's going to go home and have to use the bathroom all day long. Watch. Let me tell you, because spiritually, when God purges you, that stuff got to come out. You either going to throw it up or it's... Fourteen. 26, start at the top. God said, how long you want me to put up with you? Keep reading. Always complaining, always arguing, always in some mess, always stirring up some foolishness. C come on, keep reading. God said, I heard you. I heard you. See, most folks thank God only him when he's praying. God is, don't ever close. He hears us all the time. He sees us all the time. He read. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to say it. Just like the Holy Ghost said, then when you be grinning in folk face, all fake and phony, then talking about it. 
please do me a favor. If you're doing me like that, stay out of my face. I'm serious, because you know I'm saved now. I can't, I can't clock you in. So do me a favor, since I'm trying to stay right with God, and you don't care nothing about all that. If, if you really, with that foolishness, stay out of my face. Let me just teach you. Just show them. Let me teach you. Don't act like you love me and don't love me. Keep reading. Which murmur against me? Truly as I live, says the Lord. Whoa. So will I do to you. See, so after I leave, pay my tithes, gave my all praise and worship, then run out the door, get with some more evil folk, go to murmuring, complaining, gossiping, keep up a bunch of food, and then wonder why my prayers can't get answered. Wonder why I can't get my breakthrough. That's my teaching deep. Give me five minutes on the clock. So now, go back to Matthew 4. Instead of going to verse 4, because basically I guess God just trying to teach you how to deal with the devil. Yeah. Matthew 4, go to verse 3 and read down to verse 4, because you need to see what happened before we got here. You got it? All right. Ready to read. When what? When what? Who came? So one form the devil will come to you in is temptation. Somebody to provoke you to do evil. Temptation don't always have to be with sex and different stuff. Just anything that's against the word of God. So the tempter, he comes in different many forms and shapes to, so he can get you off. He already off. See, and the and, and reason why he's so upset with human beings that believe God is because you can get restored. He can't. I know that's good, bro. He can't. So, yeah, good, thank you. Because we're talking about the Father's heart. Watch this. So that means, just like we feel when folk try to turn our children against us, that's how God feels when you let people influence you. Am I teaching today? Anybody getting help other than me? Okay, come on, let's read. Then we're going to go on, go on. Finish reading. Ready to read? Well, wait, 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 well, because I'm gone. I might well just shit this. And, all right, Lord, I just, okay, whatever you want to say then, I tell you Man, 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 just don't have me writing all this stuff, man. You just tell me what you want to do every week, and we just do that. <laughs> all right, ready to read. <laughs> Keep reading. It is what? It is what? Hold your finger there. Go to Romans, Romans ten, verse eight. See, this is a lifestyle you have to commit to, man. This is something you got to practice every day. Because else you'll be sliding back into your old ways, religious, and all that old stuff. Come on, read. What you say it is, the word is not me, even in my mouth, and in my heart. Flip back. Flip the word is near you. Okay, flip back to four, verse four at the top part. Watch how it come together. See, people always talking about the Bible. Contradict yourself. Well, I'm going to put it together for you. All right, read that verse again. It is what? It is what? Flip back to 10 and 8. Top part 8. For what saith it? The what? The what? The word is nigh thee. The word is nigh thee. Where? All right, come on back. Come on back. Come on back. Four, three, ready, read. Keep reading. Go back to 10 and 8. For what saith it? The word is nigh thee. See, see, what did Jesus do? 
Back in Matthew, he came right back in, in Romans 10 and showed it to you again. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then you go over here, he says it's written. What was he talking about? The word. Then he go in, the, in that Romans 10 and 8 and say, for what saith it? What are you talking about? It, the Bible, what's written? What's written? What's written? See, so, so when the enemy attacks you, and he's going to attack. If you can't respond with the word, the attack is going to intensify. Watch, even when Jesus responded back with the word, let's read a little bit further. Since we got a little time, can I have five minutes of your time? All right, come on, read. The next verse, the next verse. Then the devil taking him up, took, uh huh, set him on a pinnacle, said unto him, Now, now, watch this. This was not on a test about what was in him, but about who he was. So that means the first phase, he didn't know enough word. He, 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 he was trying to see if he had enough word in it. Second phase, he wanted to know if, who, if he really knew who he was. It's like I was telling you the illustration. Boy, that's good. See, I don't go come make a full circle. When I gave this about somebody got a gun in the movie, they got a gun. I said, boy, you ain't finna shoot nobody. Give me that gun. Take the gun from him. He was trying to take the gun right there. Why? Because if Jesus didn't know who he was, it wasn't you. If Jesus didn't know who he was, watch this. Watch this. Then he could have took him out. But because Jesus, number one, knew the word, Number two, knew who he was. With that word, he was able to operate in full authority. Okay? Keep reading. See, not, not what you did. You just see what happened? The devil tried to use the word. But now if you research the scripture, he was off one or two words. Yeah, just like you talk to somebody, they be trying to act like they know the word, go to quote, quote scripture, skin in the scripture, slap up. It's the spirit of the devil. Spirit of deception. Man shall not live by bread. See, you can't, this stuff right here, you can't fake. Amen. This stuff you got to walk in. Amen. You got to know it like you know your name. Amen. He kept referring back to what was written. Now how you going to know what's written and you don't pick up the Bible to Sunday? You might come on a Wednesday. You might not. Let alone talking about intense study. I'm not just talking about a little quiet devotional time before I get in the car and go to work. Say my prayer, read two or three scriptures. That's good. That's good to develop that discipline I'm going to need to push me further in God. Are you listening to me? But if I'm going to really walk in this power and in the Father's nature, I have to on purpose become one with the word of God. Keep reading. Written again. I want you right on here. Come on, finish. We're going to finish. Keep reading. Stop. Go back up. Read that again. All these, all these, all these, what are you going to do? Wow, stop, stop. Reflect. So just because sometimes you got a few things. Don't mean you got them from God. He said all these things. Well, I give you. So I mean, he does have some permission to distribute some. He like bling, cars, houses. Ask the entertainment industry. Ask the heathen who doesn't worship God. I'm talking about the billion now. Who has no regards for God. Ask the religious man 
who has that his money has him thinking that he's all that. All these T H I N G S will I give. See, the devil don't mind giving you a dollar to keep you away from a thousand. Did you see the margin, the comparison I gave you? See, and every time, every time I don't pay my tithes, give proper offerings, I'm, I'm, I'm increasing that margin. Because the key to scripture is being willing to obey. So that's why in this church, we don't take up a one offering at the end of service. Sometimes y'all know you have to remind me to take up one and, and know we got to pay these bills. Wow, wasn't that word good? You can obtain a copy of today's message by simply calling or writing us or even emailing us at the information that will be located on the screen. Word of Life is a need-meeting church with several opportunities to serve you and your entire family. We have activities for children, youth, teens, adults. I mean, we, we try to touch the total man. We got a gym you can work out in. We got a soup kitchen that's open every Thursday. I'm telling you, there's not a place where you can't serve. So if you're looking for a place to serve, learn, and grow, then consider the Word of Life Community Church. And until next time, on the same station at the the same time, remember that without faith, it's impossible to please God, and you'll be blessed. Thank you for tuning in to Power in the Word. To order a copy of today's message, simply write to Power in the Word, 351 Southcraft Highway, Chickasaw, Alabama, 36611. We would love to have you come fellowship with us at Word of Life Community Church located at 111 South Florida Street in East Bruton, Alabama. Our service times are Sundays at 10 o'clock a.m. for Sunday school, followed by an 11 o'clock worship service, and on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. for our Power Hour Bible Study. For more information, log on to our website or call 251-456-2652 or 251-809-2887. Here's the ways that you can stay connected to the Word of Life Community Church and Life Television Network. You can go to the following websites, www.powerintheword.org or www.wordoflifetv.org. You can also view us on Ustream by going to www.ustream.tv forward slash channel forward slash life television. You can also view us on the Roku channel by clicking on the channel store going to the category titled new and clicking on life television network you can also tune into life radio network by going to the website www.tunein.com going to the search bar typing in life radio network and there you will find our station for those of you who are in chickasaw or the surrounding areas you can tune in to us on 87.9 fm you can also stay connected to us by way of social media by going to YouTube, typing in the search bar, Word of Life TV Network. You can also like us on Facebook by going to the search bar and typing in Life TV. You can also follow Dr. Roberts on Twitter by going to www.twitter.com forward slash HWROB2. We here at the Word of Life Community Church and Life Television Network thank you for your continued support. Hello friend, I am Dr. Henry W. Roberts II and I am the president of the International Fellowship of Independent Christian Churches and Ministries and also businessmen. But if you're out there and you're looking for a place where you can learn and glean a fellowship, not somewhere where somebody's trying to lord over you or be your pastor, but you want to be in a, a part of something and your church is in an independent situation, and I know that there are a lot of us out there, but we're not independent so to speak, but we're interdependent. And that's why we need fellowship. The Bible says where there's two, one can keep the other one warm. I want to come into unity and agreement with you. And I want you to consider becoming a part of the International Fellowship of Independent Interdenominational Churches and Ministries. Man, I'm telling you, we have such great meetings. We have breakfasts every quarter. And in those breakfasts, we share things that help take our ministries to the next level. There are also times when we bring in special speakers. But most of the time, we're just networking and coming together and sharing a group of pastors and ministers and leaders from the community that are coming together to create change in the earth realm. If you need a place, call home, a place that's going to love you, give you instructions and impartations that will cause your ministry to grow and change and be all that you believe God has told you it could be, will become a part or consider becoming a part 
of the International Fellowship of Independent Christian Churches and Ministry. I'm so blessed to be the president and the founder of this organization. It was birthed because I started birthing sons and we needed to be, we have a place that we could meet around and just fellowship and glean from one another. The Bible says, iron sharpens iron. So does the kindness of one friend to another. I may paraphrase that, but you know what I'm talking about. We need each other. Every joint supply. You may have a supply that I need. I may have a supply that you need. So an announcement is going to come and leave some information that you may know how to become a part of or find out when our next meeting is. I look forward to meeting you and greeting you in the name of Jesus Christ. On behalf of the International Fellowship of Independent Christian Churches and Ministries, God bless you and keep you is my prayer. To learn more about the International Fellowship of Independent Interdenominational Christian Churches and Ministries or to receive a membership packet, write to 351 South Craft Highway, Chickasaw, Alabama 36611. Or you can call area code 251-456-2652. Now it's a time when we can all participate in this. This gives you a great opportunity. If you've been blessed by this broadcast, you may be sitting behind that television screen, internet, or on your screen of your computer saying, what must I do to be saved? I am so glad you asked. It's very simple. Jesus said, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Call upon me and I will answer you. You know what? He's sitting there waiting for you to call him. All you got to do is pray this prayer for me. Repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you. That your word declares that if I will confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I would be saved. Now, God, I renounce the hidden works of the darkness, and I ask Jesus to come into my heart, come into my life, and save me, redeem me. I thank you, God, for my sins being forgiven, and I thank you for coming into my life and saving me. I believe I receive my salvation right now. Wow, it's just that simple. Listen, I want to put a powerful tool in your hand. It's free. If you pray this prayer with me or you're just watching the broadcast and you desire to know more about your salvation, I have a little book I wrote some time ago called What is Salvation? I want to put a copy of this book in your hand. It can be read in one easy setting. You can share it after you get through with it, leave it in a bathroom or share it with your friends or your family members. But it talks about what salvation is, what salvation isn't, and how you can obtain salvation and maintain your, your new walk with Christ. I want to welcome you to the family of God and thank you for tuning in each and every week or however you may watch this broadcast. And I thank you for your support, your prayers, and your seed. God bless you. And keep remembering that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Until next time, you should be blessed. To receive your copy of the book, What is Salvation? Simply write to Word of Life Community Church, 351 South Craft Highway, Chickasaw, Alabama. And remember, without faith, it is impossible to please God. you be blessed. Be sure to check your local listings for the days and times that you can view the Power in the Word broadcast. Life Community Church is here to serve you with one church in four locations. In Pritchard, Alabama, located at 1682 South Atmore Avenue, on Sundays at 8.30 a.m. In Chickasaw, Alabama, located at 351 South Craft Highway, on Sundays at 10 o'clock a.m. and 11 o'clock a.m. And in East Bruton, Alabama, located at 111 Florida Street, on Tuesdays at 7 o'clock p.m. And in Pascagoula, Mississippi, Located at 3705 Verdon Avenue on Thursdays at 7 o'clock p.m. For more information, log on to our website at www.powerintheword.org. This has been another edition of Power in the Word. On behalf of Dr. Henry and Sherry Roberts and the entire Word of Life Community Church family, we say God bless. Tune in next week to another edition of Power in the Word. And remember that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Until next time, God bless. Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Pritchard.
Mobile's new home for news and talk. 660 WXQW. We would love to have you come fellowship with us at Word of Life Community Church located at 111 South Florida Street in East Brookton, Alabama. Our service times are Sundays at 10 o'clock a.m. for Sunday school, followed by an 11 o'clock worship service, and on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. for our Power Hour Bible study. For more information, log on to our website or call 251-456-2652 or 251-809-2887. Word of Life Learning Institute is more than just a daycare. We specialize in the overall development of your child. We utilize an accelerated Christian education curriculum that teaches your children the basics they need for a strong academic future. We provide nursery through K-5 after school care and before and after school transportation. For more information, call 251-456-2650. Word of Life Learning Institute for learning and caring. family and friends if you have questions we have answers at our faith talk tuesday bible study with dr dexter easley you have what you want but i choose to speak what i desire so when i speak it so i declare in the name of jesus lord god i thank you for the automobile i thank you lord god that i'm able to receive it and father god i'm speaking according to your word that if i call those things it's not as though i desire them to be i must act like it so. So Father, I'm going to get into this car that I have now and I'm going to act like I already have what I want. I got pictures of what I want. I got things that I can see. So now my mind, my whole body is focused on what now, I don't care what nobody else says. They come in the house and say, why you got that thing sitting up there? Got what you want? You can't afford that. Father, in the name of Jesus. Faith Talk worship services begin at 7 o'clock p.m. So come and have those questions answered at Faith Talk Tuesday evenings right here at New Life Christian Fellowship Church. And we look forward to seeing you here. Well, praise the Lord. Welcome to the broadcast. I'm Pastor Dexter Easley of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. And today you got to get yourself ready. Get your pad, get your pencil out, get your Bible out as you learn about a powerful teaching. Let's go into the message already in progress. And I'll be right back. The objective of the lesson is to show you the value of Christian influence when it comes to your family, connecting to God's purpose and God's plan. For every family on the earth, God has a purpose and God has a plan for. And you are a part of that plan. Now, I'm talking to several different people here this morning. I'm talking to those that are born again, that are saved, that love the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there are those that are, that are really uh, walking with God and, and, and committed to God, but you just hadn't said, Lord, come into my heart, and you haven't received Jesus as Lord of your life. Then I'm talking to those that don't even care to say, hey, man, I'm just, I'm just here. Somebody made me come, you know. So I'm talking to different people. And but what I want to show you today is I want to talk about you being the salt of the earth. As you go over to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, are you there, class? Ready? Now read. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a, bas a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all men who are in the house. Somebody say in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. The first thing that we must understand that God has already placed in you 
the light of his glory when you're born again. When you become born again and Jesus become Lord of your life, you have the light of God on the inside of you. Amen. Now, I love that. And you are the salt of the earth. Amen. Now, go over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're still establishing, first of all, that you already, if you're born again, you are the light. Amen. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. If you're there, say, I'm there. Ready? Now read. I was two people. <laughs> Ready? Now read. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth. What? Righteousness and in truth. Amen. Finding out what is acceptable what with the Lord or to the Lord. Amen. So now what we're finding out that it is important that we are the light of the world. Amen. Now, today's lesson is talking about influencing your family. Say that with me. Influencing my family. Now, let's go and start off with this. You're not going to find the word influence in the Bible. I don't care how you look. You can, go to, you can Google it. You're not going to see it. It's not going to have influence in the Bible. But what you are going to see, and this is what I believe, I believe that word salt is actually talking about influence. It's actually talking about allowing your salt to end your life to influence others. You know, um, Lady Lisa and I went to this restaurant just a few days. I mean, I guess we was in Augusta just a few days ago. And we was in Augusta and, and we was eating nice food, really healthy food. You know, she liked to keep me with a healthy kick, you know. She'd go take this out. Of but anyway, praise the Lord. Amen. And so she takes me, she takes me to this restaurant. We stopped there and she got her food. I got mine. And uh, man, mine was delicious. I mean, it was seasoned right. And she said, you know what? My food tastes a little bland, you know, and it needs something. And so she reached over and she grabbed the salt. And so she added some salt to it. And then it was able to make her food flavor change. It was great. Still one like mine. Mine was delicious. <laughs> I had to add no salt. Amen. And, uh, <laughs> and as she added the salt to it, you can tell that she began to enjoy the meal even the more. She liked it at first, but she began to enjoy it even the more. Just think of this for a moment, that your family life and those that you know life is just planned. They have no pizzazz to it. They have no taste to it. But here you are, you the salt. But instead of you being poured out on that relationship, you're staying in the salt shaker. And God wants us to be poured out and flavored among others' lives in order to give them hope. See, Jesus Christ came to save, but he came to give life. And a lot of times we don't talk about that. He did come to save us. But why save someone and not give them a better way? That's why this lesson is called, There is a Better Way. Because Jesus came in order to give us a better way. How do I know he came to give us a better way? Let's look at this scripture. Put it up on the screen. John 10 and 10. Let's look and see the dynamics of what God says. John 10 and 10. The thief does not come except to do what? To steal, kill, and destroy. Who is the thief? Well, look at y'all. That's Satan, the devil. Y'all know where we're going. Well, who's trying to give us life? Jesus. It says, I have come that they may have life and they may have it what? More... That word life means zoe. It is the God kind of life. It's living at the ultimate end.